Okay, uh, I think we can start. Uh, welcome everyone to the second installment of our Electrical Engineering Distinguished um, Lecture Series. Uh, Bob McLeese, when he used to um, run the EESS system seminar, would start every seminar by an advertisement for the next one. So today we're in for a treat. Um, and so following in Bob's tradition, I want to say that six weeks from now we'll also be, we'll also be in for a treat. Our own Carver Mead will be giving the third and final. Oh, I see, I see. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a... um, okay, so I'll start with a brief introduction of, of Professor Kailath, um, and then um, I'll reserve the rights to, to say a few remarks, if that's okay with it. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Thomas Kailath Hitachi, uh, America Professor of Engineering Emeritus at Stanford. Um, I'm sure many of you know Tom Kailath is one of the towering figures of electrical engineering in the last half century. Um, he was born in Pune in India. Um, he was born to a family that belongs to a um, Christian community, which is probably the oldest Christian community uh, anywhere in the world, traces its, its roots back to the first century AD in Kerala, Southwest India. He got his undergraduate degree from the University of Pune. This is before there were IITs around. Um, I don't know in those days how you would get into MIT from India, but he did. Um, I know how you physically get there. Apparently, you get there by ship. Which is yeah, right. Uh, by boat. Uh, <laughs> by boat. <laughs> uh, uh, so at, at MIT, uh, another remarkable thing, and it shows you how much the world has changed. So he is the first person of Indian origin to get a PhD in engineering. Well, born in India. Amar Bose was born in this country. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but still, it shows how much the world has changed. Right. Um, so he got his PhD, worked with Jack, John Wolkencraft at MIT. He got his PhD in 61. Uh, in 63, he joined Stanford as an associate professor. Um, so that's some kind of world record for tenure, <laughs> I think. Um, and his entire professional career since then, he's been at Stanford. And he's truly something of a Renaissance man. Um, his early work was in information theory. All students of information theory know of the Schalkwick Kailath scheme, which was the first comprehensive study of the uh, role of feedback in communications. It's something that has continued to fascinate people in uh, control theory and information theory. It's, it's very relevant these days with the Internet of Things and self driving cars and drones and things like that. He's done seminal work in Estimation theory, which in the 70s led to work he did on displacement structure and fast algorithms in, in linear algebra and applied math. I think it also led to exchanges with, with scientists in the Soviet Union. I think um, so there were exchanges at the time. And I, he met you know, very, some very eminent Soviet mathematicians, Mark Crane, I believe, among others. He's done fundamental work in, in signal processing, particular adaptive filtering and Array signal processing. PP is here, who uh, has also done uh, wonderful work in that area. Um, in the early days of VLSI, and maybe there's a connection to Carver Mead, he worked in VLSI um, signal processing. He's worked in semiconductor manufacturing. Um, in the late 90s, his group was one of the places where the ideas behind MIMO, which now are YMAX, and the various XG standards that we have um, appeared. So that's work he did with. Professor Paul Raj, it's one of the places where, where this stuff happened. Um, so a very eclectic mix of, 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 of things. Um, nowadays it's, um, I think, fashionable for faculty to start companies. <laughs> I think Tom is probably one of the earliest embodiments of the uh, entrepreneur scholar. I think that, that's fair to say. So he started several companies that have been successful and have had IPOs and things of that sort. He's had all kinds of accolades. Um, I'll just mention a few. He's a member of the National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering. He won the IEEE Medal of Honor. I think he's won the highest civilian award of the government of India. Um, and in 2015, he won the National Medal of Science awarded um, by President Obama, which is the highest uh, award in science that this country can give. And this is particularly, I think, important because very few engineers um, get this award. And I should put in something for our own little department here. We have one, Amdan Yeri, also, who's 
is a winner. But, uh, so that's kind of a biography. Um, again, you, you know, um, he has you know, honorary degrees and many other things. There is a Caltech connection too. <laughs> um, and so let me describe that as I understand it. So I said that he finished his PhD in 61 and joined MIT in 63. I didn't tell you what happened in the two years between. So this is how I understand the story. So when Tom finished his um, PhD at MIT, he had an offer to stay on the faculty. And I don't know whether he deferred or declined, I don't know, but he came west. He took a position at JPL and a part-time teaching position here at Caltech. Um, and I've heard the reasons are twofold. Um, so the first reason, as I've heard, is that in those days in India, people had heard of the two great institutes of technologies in the US. And so Tom had been a graduate student at one and wanted to work at the other. And to me, that's, of course, a fine <laughs> reason. But you know, in this audience, I think we all know that you know, the people in India were misinformed. <laughs> <laughs> there are you know, two great institutes of technology in the US. So MIT is OK. Maybe it's good. But <laughs> The second reason, apparently, why he came west is as a graduate student, he had attended some conference in California, of all places in Santa Monica, on the beach. <laughs> and so you can imagine the weather, the sunshine was very different from Boston. All right. <laughs> but what was also different from Boston, and I think is different to this day, is that you know in Santa Monica, when you would step on the street, the cars would stop. <laughs> and I think that difference still exists. Right. <laughs> so um, I should have said this at the beginning as a disclaimer, and I didn't. But you know, I'm one of Tom's students, um, and so I owe a lot, you know, in my life professionally and in other ways, in which maybe this is not the, the place for me to, to describe them. But but I should acknowledge them. Um, I have many stories of Tom that I can tell. <laughs> many stories, and maybe for another occasion. But I have to tell you one, mm. and so I will end with that. Um, so Tom's office you know, used to be in a building at Stanford called the Durand Building. Now the department is somewhere else. That's where ISL, the Information Systems Lab, was. And he had a big office. And his door was always open. So you know, people could come visit. You could always ask him. He was very open, very, um, in that sense, you know, friendly. Um, if he had visitors or something, of course, the door would be closed. You know, he would close it. But if he was in the office working, it didn't matter what time of the day it was or night, he would work very late. The door was always open and he was welcoming. You could go and talk to him. But if you're a graduate student, and if you're one of his graduate students, if you entered his office, you would be greeted by the two most daunting words that any graduate student could hear. <laughs> um, you want to imagine what those two words are? So if you went to his office, and you'd be working, he would raise his head, he would look at you, and he would ask, What's new? <laughs> um, I guess that's three words. But, um, so if you want to go office with any question, if you need anything, it better be the case that you have some new result, new insight, new something. Otherwise, you know, the conversation would start on the wrong foot. But so with, with that introduction, it's my distinct pleasure to um, invite Tom to give a talk back here at Caltech after more than 50 years, belatedly so, I think, if we're, we're guilty for that, and to somewhat maybe turn the tables and ask him what's new. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Babak, for that wonderful introduction. One of the best I received. You have an excellent memory. You know, I've had many honors in my career, but. Uh, my greatest legacy, I feel, is my array of brilliant students, of whom Babak was one of them. And just to go along with the story, for many of them, when they entered my office with what's new, they, it would be two or three hours before they left. Because uh, as ba Hanok Levari, Shoki may know him, would say, you, he'd come in thinking that he had it all clear and so on. but. Uh, after some probing and discussion, no, he had to go back and do some more work and come back and repeat the process. <laughs> anyway, but it's a great experience for them and for me, especially because I learned lots of new things. As he says, moving around in different fields uh, is not easy uh, without graduation. My first 
10 or 12 papers were all, uh, first decade roughly was all individual work till I began to realize that when you move to a new field, it's good to get collections of students and work together with them and so on. And some of my talk will go to that. When talking about Caltech, yes, I was here. I lived on San Pasqual, 1161 San Pasqual, for a year with some other, three other postdocs, all famous now. And uh, opposite Roger Sperry's uh, split brain work was going on, and Gelman and Feynman were here, and so on. I, uh, and there are some stories uh, about my time the, uh, the, here, too. But the last time I was at Caltech was for Carver Maid's 80th birthday. And so I'm very happy to hear that, uh, in fact, you ho hosted us also when we were there, so. Okay, so this is a somewhat unusual talk. Uh, the one person that's heard it a few times before is my wife, who's made various suggestions to improve it. But it's a very presumptuous title, as I said. And so let me explain how it came about. About three years ago, I think, one day I get an email from a un person unknown to me from Ecuador, saying uh, there's a convention every year of the Latin American engineering uh, colleges and institutions, about a thousand people and so on. And we would like you to give the, uh, and this year it's in Ecuador, we'd like you to give a keynote address. But then they said, you know, we will uh, fly you first class and after the conference, we will give you a five-day holiday in the Galapagos. Well, by then my first wife had passed away. What was one of our dreams to go to the Galapagos and we never made it? So I replied, I said, I'm interested. But I should tell you that I'm recently married, remarried. And, uh, you know, so, prom uh, so promptly, uh, you know, I just put that up there. Uh, come back an email saying, she can join you. <laughs> then I asked, and this is a true story, what do you want me to talk about? <laughs> and they proposed this title. And I said, I've never given such a talk because my talks are usually with equations and so on. And here, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very challenging topic and so on. Anyway, they persisted. You know, it turns out that the person behind this invitation was a master's student at Stanford. So he knew about me. That I discovered later. And we had a very nice visit to Ecuador and so on. So that's the, that's the story behind it. But, you know, I've, it turned out to be interesting. But I should say, I think there are many people in the or you know, I, I see a few gray hairs like mine, but most of the people were not born when I was at Caltech and so on. But, uh, how do I move this? Yeah, so, but many people, uh, let me see. Uh, I'll make that comment in a minute. But several faculty here, and elsewhere can give similar talks based on their experiences. So I want to make that disclaimer. I'm just talking about things I was connected with. So there are two kinds of breakthroughs. One are revolutionary breakthroughs done by geniuses. Now there are many in history, but just in recent times, I mean the ones uh, Wiener and Shannon were at MIT when I was there, uh, and then lasers were invented. I guess the transistor was before that, I didn't mention that. Integrated circuits, and even the iPhone has changed, uh, you know, the way people live. You can live on your iPhone, actually. So that's the revolutionary breakthroughs. But then there are ordinary breakthroughs, and what are the characteristics? They're, you know, they're not revolutionary. They overturn the con often overturn the conventional wisdom. People thought that this was a way to do it, and you say, no, you know, that was wrong, and so on cross-fertilizing, introducing methods and tools from other fields in the problem that you're studying, and breaking presumed barriers. I and mean, one of them was in lithography, <coughs> very far from my initial interest, and I'll talk about it later, where people thought that optics would not be able to make line widths thinner than 100 nanometers. Now, we had a challenge from DARPA, and we took it up, and uh, my group then worked with uh, Motorola and built the first chip at 90 nanometers. 
and we formed a small company, Intel licensed the technology, and now they're building chips at seven nanometers. As I say, it's like when you first broke the four minute mile, Roger Bannister in 53, I remember again. Now uh, high school students break the four minute mile. So anyway, so th th those are ingredients. And what I'm going to do is sort of go through some stories actually, case studies let's say, and you can listen to them and think about what are the f f features and factors that led to these ordinary breakthroughs. And <clears throat> at the end, I would put down what I thought as eight or nine lessons to be drawn from this. So think about it yourselves and then see whether you match with mine. So disclaimers, there are no rules or magic recipes, of course. Again, you know, one does not enter saying, oh, I'm going to do this so I'll win a Nobel Prize or something. They just happen in the course of what you are doing. Okay. And the disclaimer, which I mentioned again, many others, including this audience, can give similar talks. Okay, so I'm going to go through a sequence of these things. You know, my earlier work was all largely mathematical and so on. And uh, then in the late 70s, yeah, if I remember correctly, America was falling behind in technology to the Japanese, okay? And the thought was that one area, there were a couple of areas where they thought we could begin to even the playing field. One area was VLSI, very large scale, building integrated circuits with a lot of transistors on them. At the time, the, it was LSI, where you had 100,000 transistors on a chip. And so Jim Mindel at uh, Stanford proposed the idea that we should have VLSI, one million transistors on a chip. That was the goal at that time, seemed impossible. Okay. So Stanford, you know, we are surrounded by semiconductors and we have a very strong semiconductor group. So John Linville, who was the chair, and Jim Gibbons and so had the, uh, vision that they would build a center, the first center for integrated systems which would focus on developing this kind of technology. Okay. And, uh, but to raise money for that, uh, you had to give talks to industries and government and all that to, you know, to fund it. Maybe Azita may remember some of these things. Horowitz had not yet come on the scene, but which is her advisor. So, uh, but, one, but I was on the executive committee of the department when these things were being discussed. And one issue was, what do you do with a million transistors on a chip, okay? So I said, you know, there are problems in signal processing, especially image processing, which could use this kind of capability. So I think, you know, that is, so out of a team of four people, some of whose names you may remember, uh, John Linville, Jim Gibbons, uh, Mike Flynn from Computer Science at the time, and Jim Mindel and I would go around giving talks about what could happen with VLSI and so on. So then we got the, the three of us, Jim Mindel in uh, Solid State, Forrest Basket from Computer Science, and uh, myself from Information Systems, got the first contract that DARPA ever awarded in the VLSI field, okay. So now came the question of you got to deliver, <laughs> okay. And this is the routine we used by that time, I was used to it when I moved from information theory to control, my students taught me about it and so on. So I recruited three students, brand new students, and a postdoc I had, Hanno Clevary, and we had a visitor also. And we said, what is VLSI? We don't know anything about it, you know, let's learn. So we started to learn together. And then I had a stroke of good fortune. I got a letter one day from a PhD, new PhD or about to be a PhD from Santa Barbara in chemical engineering. They're well known for their work using control theory ideas for manufacturing. So he said, can I come and work with you? So I said, yes, you know, because in fact you can help us because there's a lot of chemistry involved in VLSI, all kinds of new jargon, you know, policy, etc. So he joined, and it was very helpful, actually, as we'll talk about it. 
So we started to learn about it and with these three students. Oh, that's the next area, so. Okay, so I thought I'd, I, I had a, a full slide on this, but Anu told me that then the audience will read it and they won't listen to you. So, <laughs> so, the, so we started to do this and we slowly, you know, uh, the three students worked together in the beginning while we learned all this material. And then they eventually did theses that branched out uh, into their own individual theses. So, but they interacted and it was a very fruitful collaboration. But one of the lessons from that was, uh, one of them was Jagadish, H.V. Jagadish. Uh, and he wrote recently, uh, there was a reunion of my students. He said, what was amazing, and this is a lesson, that I knew just as little as they did about VLSI. But how, given the maturity and experience and the research is asking questions, that's what it is, okay? And, uh, you know, evaluating the answers and so on. How much they were able, I was able to help them do their research without being an expert in the subject myself. You know, we're learning together, but my age and maturity and experience uh, helped all of us move up in the field. So that's a lesson to be done. Anyway, after three or four years, they were all ready to graduate. And at that time, Bell Labs, you, uh, the old Bell Labs, used to send recruiters around every year to interview promising graduate students and, you know, in the future, attract them to Bell Labs. And one of them was Scott Kanar, who passed away recently. So he had been tracking these students. And that year, he hired all three of those students. So he went back and told his boss, there's no other professors there and so on. <laughs> anyway, I'll tell you a joke. He, he says, he told me that by the time uh, Kaila's students graduate, they do three PhD theses. <laughs> anyway, but they were all hired, okay? And uh, Jagadish was one of them. He went to Murray Hill. He moved to databases immediately. He's a big authority in databases now. The other was uh, Silesh Rao, who went to Home Dell working in electronics, actually. And he heard about the following problem. HDTV was the challenge that Bell Labs was facing. High definition television, because they thought they could overtake. The Japanese were leading electronics, Sony, Walkman, and all that kind of thing. And uh, so he heard that the designers were having problem. These are people with 10 or 12, 20 years experience, <coughs> meeting the specs, the area specs, the power specs, and so on. So he said to his office mate, Mehdi Hatamian from Iran, you know, my PhD thesis was how to systematically design architectures for signal processing, VLSI architectures for signal processing. So he said, you know, maybe those ideas can help here. So he persuaded his boss that the two of them would work on this problem. And in a few months, and I, the, the details are fuzzy now, they designed a chip that more than beat the specs. I forget the numbers now. Say two thirds the area, three fourths the power, and so on. And you know, it worked very well. In fact, you know, Home Dill magazine had a picture of the chip with uh, uh, their chip on it, designed by Silesh Rao and his, his colleague. So soon after that, <clears throat> people would come and say, this is the next biggest chip in Bell Labs history. Please help us design that. After they did two or three, they said, why are we doing this on a Bell Labs salary? So <laughs> the head of the department was uh, Bob Lucky. Some of us know him. So they told him we are leaving. He said, no, 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 we'll promote you. They promoted them to the highest level and all that. But they left anyway. And Bob Lucky said, okay, good luck. Bye bye, we're not going to give you any money. Six months later, they came to them for projects. So it was successful. The company was acquired by level one and eventually by Intel. The third student had an unusual background. And I won't go into all the details. But he was also interested in business, actually. He got an MBA part, an engineering MBA from Stanford. And he did a thesis, which was sort of, I turned down the first draft and all that, and I helped rewrite it. And then he got his fellow students. He is enterprising. 
to help him polish up his thesis so that he could graduate and so on. So he also was at Bell Labs, but in the venture division at Bell Labs. And when Silesh uh, and Mary decided to start the company, they were close friends, they worked together. He, he joined them and he helped them negotiate the buyout. Okay. So he has retired now, soon after that, and you know, he'd, he's actually a, a big pioneer for gay rights and so on. So that was the story of VLSI, okay. So let's go to the next area. So, you know, and entering a brand new field with nothing. Well, the next field is even more interesting. Babak mentioned that I've done work in mathematics, actually, in different fields of mathematics. Mostly, my PhD thesis was one of the first works at uh, using matrix theory. It was unknown at MIT, matrix theory. You know, they didn't know these things. In fact, uh, there was a book in Electrical Machines where they discovered that using matrices, you could unify synchronous machines, induction machines, and all that, which is what I learned as undergraduate. But they were afraid to use matrix notation, so they would write it out, A11X1 plus A12, X2, and so on. And in fact, I went to JPL and I attended a seminar, and there's a famous formula. If you have a matrix A whose inverse you know, and you perturb it by a low rank matrix, you don't need to recompute the whole matrix, you can modify the original one. So in this seminar, believe it or not, they said, we have figured out this formula, but we don't know how to prove it. So we are doing a lot of computer simulations and they work. Well, you know, this is this A, B, C, D, lemma. A plus B, C, D inverse is equal to something. How do you verify it? You multiply by A plus B, C, D, the product is one, and you check that the right-hand side is one. But the mathematical level of sophistication in engineering in those days was so low that, you know, they were not able to do that. It has dramatically changed. I mean, now it's too abstract to follow many of the works that have been done, including by PP and so on. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, I used to give talks in linear algebra, these talks, and one of them, there was a very smart, uh, famous professor at City University called Lou Auslander. He was Einstein professor or something. But he was what I call a streetwise mathematician. Most mathematicians can only talk to them in their own language, you see. But he followed. So he said to me, I, you know, I'm interested in what you're doing. Let me tell you that I'm going to DARPA to run the mathematics program. And uh, when I'm there, send me a white paper and we'll see if we can fund you. Now, till then I had NSF money, Air Force money, other 50,000, 100,000. DARPA minimum is a million or two million and so on. So I said, great. I didn't hear from him. One day, uh, two years later, I get a call in my office, I pick it up and I say, hello. Oh, hi, Tom, this is Lou. I said, Lou, where have you been? He says, this is a long story, I'm finally at DARPA. That's the good news. The bad news is I have no money because it has been given away by my predecessor. Moreover, mathematics has been moved from the information technology office to material science. I said, why? He joked. He said, the general in charge of doubt thought that all the M's should be together. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, I have no money, I have no work, I just wander around listening to seminars, you know, but, and this is the area of stealth materials, you know, how to make composite materials. He said, they're very interesting, they're all physicists and chemists, but they have no idea how to manufacture these things, you know, it's like in the old days making steel, uh, you know, how do you harden it? By hammering it. You don't know the theory behind it. Heat, beat, and hope was the message. Heat, beat, and hope. So he said, you know, I think they could use control theory ideas, signal processing ideas, you know, simulation, all these things. Too. So I have no money for mathematics, but I can give you money for manufacturing. So this story is in print, by the way, in the American Math, because he passed away a few years later, and I wrote a tribute to him in the book. So I was telling, I said, Lou, that's very kind of you, but you know, I only write papers, and in manufacturing you've got to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, it's okay, you know, I give you plenty, and make a long story short, time is possible. He says, I'll give you plenty of money, and so on, 
and uh, you pick any problem you want. And I said to him, you know, do I see a DAPA once monthly report? How can I do that with graduate students? No, 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 annual report is enough for me. So I was reluctant. Finally he said, it doesn't matter if you fail. I think it's worth trying. So let me give you $2 million for three years and you see what you can do. Okay, so. So I went to the Center for Integrated Systems, which had been formed now, and I was a part of the beginning of it. And I, the first person I met was an Indian, I mean, I knew, I went to see him, Krishna Saraswat, who I knew was working there. So I said, you know, what problem do you have? He said, oh, we have a problem, rapid thermal processing. And we are having trouble achieving the results that they want. Uh, the Air Force had given a large contract to TI to demonstrate in three years or something a thousand way for a run of a special kind of processing equipment in the semiconductors. I'll show you in a minute. And uh, the person in charge there was a student of Krishna, so he gave Krishna a subcontract to help. So Krishna said, you know, that's a problem. And we were lucky, you know, it's a non-hazardous uh, problem. You don't have to worry about things, uh, poisons, and don't, you know, you can't use SEM equipment and so on because they watch you to make sure you don't damage the equipment and so on. So, so we decided to do it. So what is the problem? Oh. Gee, the, aren't there more slides in between? I think those slides come later. Is there a way of doing, sorry, let me just go through this. Uh, there must be about 20 slides, where are they? I, we can go, do, do you mind if I go through? Yeah. Because I think they come, if, if you look. Oh, I see, okay, yeah, <laughs> okay. So this, I already told you the story, okay. So what should I do then? You can just continue then, if you told this, I think that okay. the book will come Okay, right, down. okay, yeah. So I already told you the story, and that's rapid thermal process. So what is rapid thermal process? Oh, and the next problem was the barrier that I mentioned. This is a new way of manufacturing semiconductors at the time that I already mentioned. You see, the state of the art at the time was you had big fabs, you know, large things, all clean rooms and all that. They made large volumes of a single kind of chip, okay? And you needed high throughput to make money. They wanted that much uh, DRAMs, for example, 25,000 per month. At that time, they were, uh, at that time, it only cost 500 million to build a fab. Now it's well over three to four billion dollars. And uh, the new generation comes up every two years, three years, you have to build a new fab. Okay. The military wanted, they say, we don't need all these multi-purpose chips we can buy. We need specialized chips for special applications. So we, there are many different kinds of chips we need, but they, they want not large volumes of them, small amounts of them. For example, they're happy to get 1,000 wafers per month of high value added logic A6 process. And we want it to be cheap and so on. So what do they do? They, you have a little, say, cube. You can sometimes have a rectangle as below. This is one inch diameter, or one 12 inch diameter, sorry. At that time, the wafers were eight inches. And uh, you, uh, you have a robot, it's a vacuum uh, chamber in there. You have a robot that puts an integrated circuit on top of that. And the goal is, as shown in the graph there, to heat this wafer from room temperature to say 1000 degrees, depending on the process. Hold it constant for a variable amount of time, from one minute to three or four minutes. And then cool it as quickly as you can, uh, so that the next wafer can be put in and processed and so on. And you go to another module like this to do a different semiconductor. One is annealing, one is oxidation, one is, uh, you know, there's so, so many different things, layer, a new layer and all that. Now, you want to do this as quickly as possible so you can move things. But if you heat too fast, you'll warp the wafer. If you cool too fast, you'll, so you have to balance it. That they sort of figured out. But they were having trouble keeping the temperature uniform across the whole wafer for this period of time, okay? So they tried all kinds of things. There were small companies which would make products. One of them, Shuki Meno, uh, Levi Gertzberg, or AG, no, AG, Arnon Gart, AG Systems. He had, uh, the first thing was 
uh, you have a parabolic reflect. So you heat it with halogen lamps producing heat. See there's lamps on top heating the wafer. And uh, you ref this was you had a single heat source and you reflected off that to try and get uniform distribution across the wafer. The goal was uniform heat flux across the wafer. Okay. Didn't work too well, so they had another scheme where you had a bank of lamps, say, going into the board there in one direction, and underneath, another bank going at right angles to it, trying to heat it. There were some other things also. None of them seemed to work. So that's what we came into the problem. And he said, you know, for people in the systems control field, the first thing you do is, th this was all trial and error. They would tweak the res resistance to see what, you know, what adjustment worked and so on. We said, you know, make a model, a mathematical model, a simplified model, because you can't capture all the features, to try to get insight into what is going on and so on. Okay. That's the first step. Then, as I was just saying, the real world is very complicated. To make something that's mathematically tractable, you have to abstract and simplify it so that you can use your techniques, okay? It turns out you need all kinds of different mathematical tools, PID control, H-infinity, convex optimization, whatever, and and then finally, once you have a solution, mathematical solution, is usually too complicated to implement in an engineering way. So you have to understand, and this happens even in pure mathematical research that we do in information theory and so on, and Babak is a, one of the first things he did was get insight into a couple of problems that I gave him. Why is this mathematics working out the way it is? There must be a, a simple, ex that's why it took many hours of discussion to try and find the simplest understanding of a problem. So gain enough physical and intuitive understanding of the mathematics to translate the mathematics into a usable solution. So that's the steps. And what does practical mean? It should be able to do it and it shouldn't cost too much. What did we learn? We made first, instead of a wafer, two dimensions, we made a single dimension. Now I, I got three colleagues to help me, Gene Franklin and Stephen Boyd. And, and again, a group of students who, who do the work, actually. And we discovered from this single rod problem, we're trying to heat it, that this conventional wisdom that what you want to try to get is the same heat flux at all is wrong. Because there are many effects, you know. There's radiation from the wafer, which is nonlinear, Stefan's law. There's conduction along the wafer. There's convection, the gas is passing over it to do your processing, that takes heat. Moreover, you're in a uh, cylinder or box, there's reflection from the walls and so on. So it's a highly nonlinear problem. And, uh, but, you know, we, made, we went through those steps and we said, you don't need uniform flux. In fact, it's the wrong thing to do. You need non-uniform flux distribution over the wafer. Moreover, the control, the semiconductor engineers used to buy the heating system from some other box, which is a black box with one knob which changes the resistance, <laughs> okay? And that's all you do. They said, no, you need multivariable control. You cannot solve it with single variable control. So what did we do? We were lucky, okay? It turns out that one of the systems they had, and I won't go through the details here, they had a system with two rings of halogen lamps connected to each other so that they're controlled by a single control box. We said, why don't you add one in the middle so you'll get three. And we broke the links and we had three, uh, and we made some tweaks and so on, not important at this stage. So it took us a couple of years, and this postdoc of mine was very uh, instrumental because he was a bachelor and he would go back to TI uh, to check out what we did on their systems and so on, and we had a thing. And in the process he got married to, uh, after all these trips, but anyway, 
That's a side effect. So first we did the modeling, mathematical modeling of heat transfer. And actually just to tell you again, you're all electrical engineers. So this work went so well that the project, by then Lou had retired, and the project monitor was Jim Crowley, some of you may know him, is now head of SIAM, had me make a presentation for 15 minutes to Gary Denman, who was the head of DARPA. It turns out he's a mechanical engineer. So he made the presentation, it went on for about 45 minutes, actually he got interested. And he said, oh, heat transfer, who did you work with in the mechanical engineering department? Because he knew them. I said, no, sir. What I understand, the students went to the library and got some books on heat transfer and figured out what to do. So he said to me, oh, I forgot. Electrical engineers can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true when I went to MIT. They were doing basically neuroscience. One of the famous papers was, what does the frog's eye tell the frog's brain? Then they were dissecting cat's ears to study things. You know, all over the field, Warren McCulloch was, etc. Anyway, so double E is a great field to be in, okay? Though computer science now claims otherwise, but however. <laughs> <laughs> so we developed it, we demonstrated it, and then we transferred, thanks to Chuck Schaefer, Schaefer transferred and customized it on 13 different processes and eight different kinds of uh, rapid thermal processes. And then we were successful, okay. But the fallout was, soon after that, the military lost interest. They said no, so I was disappointed that our work wasn't. But a few years later, I was at a party at Krishna's, Saraswat's house, and I was sitting next to someone from AMD. And he said, oh, I know you, because we use your work all the time. Because it turns out that rapid thermal processing is quite, there's a big industry now, for specialized parts of the semiconductor fabrication process, they use RTP. So we were lucky at the end. Okay. okay. Now one problem with DAPA money is that every three years they want you to find a new problem. <laughs> now my interest is not really control theory, by then I was long past control theory, but signal processing. And again, I hired some students and so on. I said, what are the problems? I was lucky to get a postdoc who had worked at NRL uh, on lithography. So I said, okay, he wanted to come work with me. His thesis is on wavelets. I said, I'm not interested in wavelets, but I have money, I can give you money, like repeating, I can give you money for manufacturing. <laughs> so he came. <laughs> that was helpful. And what is the problem? You know, just briefly, you have a silicon wafer on which you want a pattern of ones and zeros, basically. And how do you achieve that pattern? You have a mask which is supposed to reflect that pattern, and then you illuminate it by light, which passes through the holes on the mask and exposes uh, the resist, it's called a particular resist, for enough time to either kill it or if the mask is blank, then it leaves it as it is, okay? But this is an electromagnetic problem. There is inaccuracy, it's not laser light, it's incoherent light. The lenses are not perfect. They have their own issues. Therefore, the mask pattern cannot be the same as the pattern that you want on the chip. Okay. Because on the chip is ones and zeros, and the mask is electromagnetic, and there's an amplitude and phase at every point. So you have to carefully design the mask so that it takes account of the non-coherence of the light and the lens issues, aberrations, and depth of focus, and things like that, and uh, produce the wafer. Okay. How did they do it? We had a visitor from Intel. We invited people from Intel, a young lady. They would spend eight hours a day trying to design a mask, because it's highly non-linear. If you, put a zero, if you put some amplitude and phase somewhere and you change it, then it changes the whole design. If you go to another point and do it, it changes the whole design because it can. So, very time consuming. So we said, let us make again a mathematical model for this, okay? And uh, so we did. We solved approximately an inverse problem, a difficult inverse problem. How to go from a pattern of ones and zeros through this complex electromagnetic and design 
a collection actually of phases because we kept the amplitude constant uh, to solve your problem, okay? Now it turns out that there was a, already an effort in this direction uh, by uh, Mark Levinson at IBM and he had uh, made some stuff by called phase shifting. I don't have time to go into it. It's a particular signal processing technology. But it was too limited to solve the problems that people wanted. And what they wanted was here, when we entered the field in 94, Semitech uh, made a presentation at a meeting in San Diego, Defense Science Research Council. And her messages were the following. You need a systems approach to You have to work on exposure, mass, metrology. See, lithography is more than one third of the cost of the fab. Yeah? It's, the, it's the bottleneck of semiconductor manufacturing. Okay? But all these things are involved. They said optical lithography will be the mainstream to the one gigabyte. Oh, by then, you know, nowadays there are trillions of chips on a ch uh, transistors on a chip. By then it was one gigabyte. One million is long gone. Uh, this is, and the line width is 180 nanometers, okay? And the light that, uh, I'll tell you about this in a minute. Optical enhancements will be needed to extend it to 250 nanometers sources. The source they had was 365 and 180 nanometers using the, sorry, to go down to 250 nanometers, quarter of a micron, using the existing light, 248 nanometers. Well, this is on her slide. Alternatives to optical lithography will be, need to be pursued for the 180 gen. Gordon Moore was in this camp and they were trying to develop something called X-ray didn't work, ion beam didn't work, EUV, which 20 years later is just beginning. Okay. What is the gap? You see, here's the problem. You want to make chips with, uh, in the 90, 1980 where the line width is three microns, okay? Because, okay, then the next generation had two microns. The, the narrower the critical dimension, the more transistors you can put on a chip. That's the goal, okay? And what was the source they were using was a 436 nanometer, nanometer uh, source. So here's the goal, you see. You have to draw a line, say, using a pencil. Now if you have a very thin pencil and you want to draw a thick line, it's easy, you keep drawing it. But if you want to draw a line that's thinner than the pencil, what do you do? So in the old days, that was not a problem because the source was three for 436 nanometers, then it went to 365 nanometers and you wanted to build 600 my, uh, nanometers chip. So it's still possible. But then you come to a crossover point. That's called the sub-wavelength gap, where the source, the thickness of your pencil is thinner, is thicker than the line you want to draw. Okay. What do you do? That was the problem. So you have to find a new source and so on. So they went to one nine to three one. Two, three. I think they're now there, actually, probably. Anyway, so this was the situation that we faced. Okay. Again, we made a mathematical model. We made a proposal to DARPA. It is called Multivariable Control Simulation Optimization Signal Processing for the Microprocess. And we said we can do the following. You want a chip which looks like on the left, but with current technology, what you get is what you see on the right. Okay. And we proposed to improve the system to produce what you need for this, okay. Oh, I should tell you a story, actually. DAPA was so pleased with the results of our RTP work that Crowley decided that they started six programs around the country to apply double E methods, signal processing control and so on, to different problems in manufacturing, okay. And we chose lithography. Other people use etching and so on, so. Anyway, and so they had a program called Intelligent Design and Manufacturing in Electronics. So how about the progress there? In 1997, three years after we started, Bern Lin, who's a member of National Academy and very high up in TSMC, gave an interview. He says, I think microlithography will stay around 130 to 150 nanometers line width by optics. 
with very specific supercritical levels using E-beam for 100 nm. E-beam is very, very slow process, okay? You won't get enough throughput. So you sometimes, and he read, this is his speech, his interview. This limit is going to stand for a long, long time unless there's a significant breakthrough that nobody knows about and at this moment nobody anticipates, okay? That's the next line you can read yourself. He didn't know that we, le we formed a small company from the PhD thesis of Yao Ting Wang uh, and led to challenge this barrier. And uh, in 1999, we worked with Motorola and on February 4th, I think it was, they put out an announcement. The first 100 nanometer processor sizes using the standard 180 nanometer source, okay. Fabrication was using technology, phase shifting and OPC, it's called from numerical, that's the name of our company, okay. So, you know, another fortunate success based on mathematical ideas. So what we did is we made, an, this is a talk I gave, actually it's interesting, uh, breaking the 100 nanometer barrier and there's a typo there, in uh, optical microlithography via signal processing. We're using super resolution ideas from communications. And so from doctoral research to Wall Street. Because this company went public in 2000. At a difficult time actually because the market economy was turning down. And uh, anyway, then later we were acquired. We solved, if you wondered, we solved uh, an approximate uh, inverse problem. What is the idea of phase shifting? You see, suppose you want to make two parallel lines, okay? You have a, the mask which has a, a, tr a, a line, a width like this. You shine light through it and what appears on the focal plane is the Fourier transform you may know because of the light process. So of a rectangle, the Fourier transform is sine x over x. But if you have two lines close together, the sine x over x blend and you get this peak where it's hard to know whether they're separate and the closer they are, they blend. Okay. Mark Levinson at IBM had the idea, he said, for the second line, you shift the phase by 180 degrees. Okay. So then it's the negative of sine x over x and when you take the amplitude, there's a null in between. So you can separate. Okay. But the idea is, so what do you do if instead of two parallel lines, you have a, a pie? One line, one line, and a bridge. You, you can't figure out so. So when we first started the problem, Fabian Pease from famous in lithography at Stanford was one of the people on the project. And we worked out the solution and it gave us a pattern of, one, of, uh, fa of phases at different points on the mask. Okay. So he said, let's build it. HP, I worked with HP, the, the graduate refused. That's going to take us five years and so on. We can't do it and so on. Well, then my uh, postdoc had a brilliant idea. He said, what is it, you, and this is interesting, what is it you're trying to do? On the wafer, you want different regions with different phases, okay? Now, this is like coloring a map with different countries and you want to color the map so that no two adjacent countries have the same color. Now you know it's a famous problem, the four color problem. It was finally solved with a mathematical solution which had to be verified by about a large number of computer calculations. Okay, so it's not a pure mathematical. But that's the integrated circuit problem. You want to color, so only four phases are enough. But it turns out for various reasons, two phases are best to use. So we introduced the idea, which is now common in the literature, in the industry, double patterning. You use one binary, and then you repeat it with another binary, okay. Now you have alignment problems. Anyway, that was our solution, and so it's worked out pretty well. Now I can, what is the time actually? So. My former student, John Chiaffi, is called the father of DSL, okay. So he was at, Bell he was at Stanford and uh, 
graduated, went back to Bell Labs. He was laughed out of the room when I pushed for more speed than the 160 kilobits per second, then coming into discussion. I said that we could do one and a half megabits per second. Okay. Why? Because he had worked out the channel capacity of the telephone line, of the line wire that was carried, and it is one and a half. And he said, you know, that should be portable. It didn't work out. So he came to Stanford then. We hired him. And he developed his, uh, the technology with his student and formed this company, which was acquired later and so on. And that's his group. John Shafi is down at the bottom. And at the time I provide this slide, it is 70% of the work. But now the speeds are much higher in DSL. But, you know, it was negative, but he persisted. And he worked it out, again with the graduate students, and using theory of different kinds to do it. Vint Cerf once uh, told me, actually, that uh, communication engineers thought that packet switching, breaking up the data into pieces and reassembling them, wouldn't handle speech, let alone video, because store and forward would have too high a latency. Now, of course, on your iPhone, you're streaming. <laughs> okay. Oh. You know, you should look up, there's this remarkable engineer who introduced the words uh, resistance, uh, what's the admittance, inductance, and so on. He designed, uh, you see, people, uh, telephone lines, you want to increase the speed. And he proposed that you should use add inductance to the line. And he get what he called distortionless transmission. So the chief engineer of British Pooh put the idea. You know that inductance is, slows things down while it's speeded up. No, the mathematics show that you need inductance. And later, uh, Pupin and all made a lot of money by doing loading. So it's, skepticism is not new. Now just to conclude, I just, Anu pushed me to say, this is all old stuff, what's new stuff, okay. Well, recently we've been working a little bit on this area, but not you, so let me go through the slide. You know, deep neural network is heard about, you have layers of neurons, many, many layers of them. And you put in data and it does uh, various calculations, nobody quite knows what's going on. But then it produces a result at the end, which is very remarkably successful in certain fields speech recognition, face recognition. You can, trans Google Translate can take you a long way. But I want to say this is all new, I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in this field by any means, but many people have said it's irrational exuberance about AI going to, and DNNs going to solve all our problems. They're very fragile, you know, you take an image and you perturb it a little bit and the machine has memory, but it has a face in it. So it's very difficult. So people are working on this, you know. But my point is, and I'll, that what you need is, we need more theory to understand what they are doing. You know, nobody knows what's happening. They have some idea about it. And, but here are some questions, for example. How many really layers do you need, instead of 500 and so on, to achieve a certain performance in a particular application? Nobody quite knows. There's trial and error right now, okay? But I, this is a talk I gave, actually, at the National Academy when I uh, got the Simon Ramo Medal. And I said, we need concepts such as Shannon's channel capacity which defines an upper limit beyond which reliable can. So we need more, now people are working on this and I haven't been able to follow all that work, but people are thinking about these things. But to emphasize the role of theory in my talk there, and Anu reminded me to tell you the story, which I first mentioned to Amnon Yariv, who was just mentioned here, you know, because he and I were on a DAPA, used to meet for two weeks every summer, or two or three weeks in La Jolla, and Amnon was one of them. And because of Lou Auslander, I was put on the council. So I was talking about theory of this. So I said, let me tell you, a fa adapt a fairy tale uh, by A. A. Milne, who was the author of Winnie, Winnie the Pooh, which many of your children will know about, okay?
and it's called a matter-of-fact fairy tale. In a big forest long, long ago, there was a giant who had just acquired the latest technology. They're called seven-league boots. A league in British times was three miles. Every step would take you 21 miles. Okay, fantastic. But he had an invitation to visit a friend 11 miles away. Okay. So he strapped on his boots and he went out in the forest. And of course, you know, he took a step and he was far beyond 11 miles. So he tried an angle coming back. He got frustrated finally after many efforts. He went back home and took off his boots and went. The problem, the author says, says this was in the days before Euclid. And what our giant did not know was that what he had to do was construct an isosceles triangle with a base of 11 miles and two sides of 21 miles. Okay. So theory is useful. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, no, no, sorry, sorry. I promised you, what are the lessons from all these uh, stories that I've been telling you? Okay. They're not all easy, you know. Find the right problem. I don't know how do you find the right problem. But that's the secret of success, okay? Luck is a factor. But luck doesn't just happen, by the way. You somehow, you know, this is, I can't say it the best way of people. You have to be prepared to be lucky. You know, you must have enough back, whatever it is. Okay. Be alert to opportunities and seize them, okay? So, you know, lithography comes along, fine, you know, there's new money. I had a big student group and so on. Okay. Have broad interest to be able to cross-apply tools and perspectives and ideas from other fields, okay? That's what we did, if you remember, in these different problems, okay? Be confident and take risks. I illustrate that. Very important, for, especially for graduate students. Don't wait to start till you have all the... Pre Let me take two more courses so that I'll have the right background to do research on this field. No, I like a quote from Dr. Zhivago. Man, man is born to live, not to prepare to live. So you have to plunge in, you know. As we, VLSI, you know, we didn't know. Team up, there's power in groups, you know, you exchange ideas and so on. That's what it is. Perhaps more, but this is a collection that I had. So, thank you. And if you have ideas to add to this list, you know, send me a note. Thank you. Bye bye. So, we have a small reception following this where you can, you know, talk in person to Professor Kailath if you want, but we have maybe time for one question. I am better. <laughs> what do you think about going forward with all the activity that's going to take place in the quantum world? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very, that's very interesting, actually. And I literally, I'm sure at Caltech also, it's happened with Yelena Vukovic and Stanford is making a big push in this area. It seems that quantum computing is closer to realization than people had imagined for a long People had written it off. But I believe they are now a little more, I mean, they have up to 50 qubits, I believe, IBM and other companies. So there is some hope there. But there are other ideas. You know, someone sent me recently a paper on a former student that they're using quantum ideas to improve lithography. I didn't, I couldn't follow the paper and I didn't really spend a lot of time on it. So, you know, there are very interesting ideas there which, uh, you know, people are exploring and could work. I mean, for communication, maybe Babak knows, entanglement is a concept that people use. And, and maybe at USC there are people. So, so it's, a, it's an interesting area. But personally, I think neuroscience is the next big challenge. So. so. Okay, let's thank Professor Frank. Thank you. Yeah, fine.